so with that, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Joe Rubino and hand it over to him to, dis uh, to start our discussion on creating a winning proposal um, through, uh, through contracts, uh, through winning more contracts through a <laughs> winning proposal. I apologize, Joe. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Amanda. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, we're going to take a look uh, now at the uh, beginning of this uh, presentation. And you'll see on here, uh, title is Creating a Winning Proposal with Transportation Alliance. Now, if you are not familiar with the Transportation Alliance, it's important to know that our former name uh, was the Taxi Cab Limousine and Paratransit Association. And, and why am I mentioning that now? I'm mentioning that now because this, um, this presentation I'm going to do right now is going to be of value to you, no matter what type of a company you are operating. If you're operating a taxi company, a sedan company, a car service, a non-emergency medical company, a limousine company, a bus company, a shuttle company, whatever type of service you're running, this uh, presentation is going to be generic and it's going to be of value to you. But the second reason I have this screen the way it is, is I, I want to show you how kind of attractive it is. You'll look, you'll see it's a nice photo. It's got nice graphic. It's got nice uh, little logo up in the corner there. It's got the date across the bottom. It's got uh, creating a winning proposal with title. This, this first page is a metaphor, an example of the first page that you should do, you should have, you should create for your proposal. Let me, let me explain what I mean by this. And when you compete for a, a contract, you may be competing against other local companies. You may be competing against companies in your state. Or you may be competing against a combination of those, plus you may be competing against a national competitor, especially if you're going for a non-emergency medical contract or a paratransit contract, or even part of a transit contract. There are national companies, companies that, that are located in different cities, they're not in Massachusetts, and uh, companies like uh, MV Transit out of Dallas, First Transit out of uh, Cincinnati, uh, TransDev, which is out of Baltimore and Chicago, um, then you have Keolis, and you have um, uh, National Express, all of these companies. And these companies bid all over the place. They bid, you know, once a week somewhere around the country. And a lot of times they, they win. And a lot of times they, they, they win the proposal. And they win the proposal, they win the bid, despite not even having a presence in your town. Imagine if you were located like in Braintree or in Lowell, Man, or somewhere. And you bid a contract and you lost out to a company in Cleveland. Think about it. Okay. Why did you lose that company? Why did you lose that contract to a company that doesn't even exist in your town? You lost because of the proposal. These companies are in the proposal business. They're not in the transportation business. They're in the proposal business. If they win a contract in Braintree or in Quincy or in Boston, they're going to come in and hire the same people that are doing the contract now. They're gonna hire the drivers and the dispatchers from the current provider. They're playing, they're playing, uh, you know, like, it's like a game. So, so what I'm saying is why did they win the proposal? They won the proposal because they submitted a proposal that looked like a magazine. So what I'm gonna uh, show you today is that when you wanna win a bid, you have to create an image of your company that will compete with the best companies in your region, whether they're local or whether it's not a town. I'm gonna to tell you a, a real quick story here. In 2008, I was hired by a, by a uh, governmental agency. They were a hospital district. They basically were in a, a, a state and they, they ran a whole bunch of different hospitals and medical centers. And they had a transportation service they were not satisfied with. They wanted the new transportation service. So they knew me, they hired me. They said, Joe, we want you to write the RFP. We want you to put the RFP out. We want you to accept the bids. We want you to help us pick a, a winning bid. And the other people on my team were people that worked for the hospital district. They didn't know anything about transportation. It was like an accountant, the, the head of nursing, the head of the ER, the head of a, 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 you know, their lawyer, 
a doctor, a nurse, and so on and so on and so on. So there was there was 12 people in this group, me and 11 other people. So we get all the we get all the bids in. We get like 10 bids. Some of these looked like a mag one looked like a magazine. It was from a company out of state. Some were nice, they looked like a college term paper. Some looked like crayon on a paper bag. I'm telling you, it looked like it was written by a four-year-old. But there were a couple that were pretty good. And I said, well, these are some good local companies. You know, I can, I can offer these up as good, good examples who could do this contract. It was taking patients back and forth every day, Monday through Saturday, to all of these different hospitals, campus. It was a nice contract, about a $500,000 a year contract. It's real nice for a local company. It's a nice contract, $500,000. We got one bid from a national company. It looked like a freaking magazine. All right. It was one of the companies I named earlier. I will not tell you which one. As I went through this thing, I'm thinking like, this is nuts. This company does not have a location within 500 miles of here. How are they gonna operate this contract? How are they gonna put six vehicles here, 10 vehicles, whatever it was, they're not even anywhere near. They're, they're, in a, they're, they're two states away. I realized what they're gonna do. They're gonna hire whoever's running it now and, and you know, put, put, a, put lipstick on a pig and say, okay, this is us. <clears throat> so I decided, you know what, I need proof. You know, I need I need something to convince the other members of my. So I called up the five, the five references they gave. They gave five references. The first two did not work for the government agencies they claimed to work with. They worked for the company that was making the bid. In other words, they they bid a city, they won the contract. A year later, they hired the person who gave them the bid. Now I don't know if that's illegal or not, but that's what happened. The other two, the two, the next two. They gave them bad reviews. They said, oh, uh, I, I'm not going to give you a reference. These companies suck. But, you know, this company is terrible. We, we just fired them. Why did they use this as a reference? And I called the fifth one, and uh, they weren't even working anymore. So five references, all crap. Now, why am I telling this story? Because on Monday morning, when I sat down with the team, remember the nurses, the accountants, the doctors, the accounting people, to pick, I asked for a show of hands. Every single person at that table picked that company. Unanimous. They all wanted the company. I said, did you call any of the references? No. I said, I did. And I explained to them what I just told you. Why am I telling this story? Because these people who were giving out a half million dollar a per year contract picked a company where the references were bogus and they, they were going to use the same company drivers and dispatchers of the company that the hospital just was firing. You follow me? So, but they still were, if I wasn't there, they would have won the time. So you, that's what you have to compete with, okay? So we can go to the next slide here. Okay, that's me, I live in Florida, there's palm trees here, who cares? We can go to the next slide, okay? <laughs> All right, so, so this is something I mentioned in my, a previous uh, presentation I did a couple months ago. If you haven't gotten that one, uh, ask for it uh, after this is over. Uh, we'll give you a copy of that. Um, and in, in that one, I was I was talking about building a portfolio. It's so important for your local people to know who who you are. In other words, your local politicians, your local uh, transit agency, your local MPO. Now, if you don't know what MPO is, it stands for Metropolitan Planning Organization. Every city in the country has an MPO. It means that every region has planners. And a lot of these planners are the ones who make the decisions on who to hire. It's also good to know the transit agency folks. You may not like the transit agency folks, but you may win a contract from them. You may win a subcontract from them. We have plenty of uh, 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 people in our organization, the TTA, including a whole bunch of them in Massachusetts that are subcontractors to their local uh, transit agency. Uh, one of our clients, uh, I'm sorry, one of our members, former president Tom Arigi, uh, he is a uh, subcontractor for Gatra, which I think you five folks probably know is the Greater Attleboro uh, Transit Agency down in uh, the south of Boston. Tom has been a subcontractor down there for very many, many years. So, and why does he keep winning contracts there? Because he knows all the people there. They like him. They like his company. So, also, next bullet point, get on an email list to receive notifications. Now, you should know what an RFP is. If you don't, it means a request for proposal. An RFB request for bid, an RFI uh, request for information, RFQ request for qualification. They're, they're all RFs. The point thing is you might know them as a bid list. Get on the bid list. 
and make sure you're on all those bid lists. And that's another subject I covered in the previous webinar. So look for that if you get a copy from Amanda or Amanda points you how to get a copy at the end of this presentation. The next last bullet point here is when the RFP comes out, make sure you've signed up with your email to receive all the agenda. What I mean by that is when the RFP comes out sometimes, as soon as it comes out, everybody reads it, they say, wait a second, we got questions. And all of a sudden the agency who put the RFP out, oh, oh we forgot some. So now they have to put out an addendum to, uh, to, to, to cover what they missed. Okay, we can go to the next slide now. So in this process, you have to read all the documents, highlight, make an outline of all the requirements, now I'm gonna cover them a little in a little bit later, but the report, here's the thing you all have to know. To answer an RFP is very simple. There's only two parts of the RFP that are important. I mean, the whole thing is important, but the two parts you need to make your proposal. One is called the scope of services. So that's one thing you might wanna write down, scope of services. Scope of services means this is what you gotta do if you want the contract, all right? And the next part is called contract requirements. These are things you have to comply with to be able to provide those scope of services. If you get an RFP and like a PDF, you, you could just, if, if you can copy and paste from there, do it, if not convert it to a Microsoft Word and just literally copy and paste the scope of services and the contract requirements onto a page of Microsoft Word and boom, you've already started your proposal. It's that simple. Okay, you have to attend the pre-bid conferences, go there even if it's not mandated. Go anyway, let the people there know who you are and learn out who the players are, and then to submit questions before the deadline so your questions can be in. Okay, we'll go to the next slide now. Um, <clears throat> here's the kind of information that you need to compile. Now this, you don't have to write this stuff down. This is why I'm telling you to get a copy of this thing, you know, and Amanda will tell you how to do it later on. This is kind of a compilation of everything you should have in a proposal. And if you don't have it, you should compile it. This stuff is not that daunting. You should have a company handbook. You should have company brochures. You should have a reservation process. You should know what your technology is. And your technology is not that hard. I once, uh, I shouldn't say once, all the time, when my, me and my staff, we do proposals for clients. We do about, uh, I don't know, a hundred a year. We're doing like two a week year round in my company for, for people all over the country. And a lot of times we tell them, you know, give me what your, what your technology is. Give me what your reservation system is. Give us what your dispatch system is. Give us what your camera system is. Well, I don't know, Joe, we don't have it. It's a hard copy. I say, just tell us what it is. Send, send me an email and say, you know, it's Motorola, you know, a uh, uh, model 264, blah, 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 blah. Well, my staff will go online on Motorola's website and literally copy it off there. They, I guarantee you will find a brochure for you on the Motorola website or on whatever the website is. And we'll, we'll convert it to a PDF and put it right in your proposal for you. So it's really not that difficult, but you should have this stuff, the bios, resumes, photos, so on and so forth. And you need to have a drug and alcohol policy. You're not gonna be winning many contracts unless you have that. Okay, we can go to the next slide. This is more of the same thing. You need to have a sexual harassment policy if you're going to win a contract. You got to have driver training material. You may have this stuff, but it may not be compiled. So one of the things that uh, you know uh, you're going to need to do is you're going to need to put it together in a way that this is all organized and all put electronically. So if you have a lot of this stuff in print form or in hard copy form, you need to make sure you have it electronically as well phone training material, safety training material, or you should hire a consultant to do this, or I'm gonna talk about later on, you may have somebody on your team who is technology uh, 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 knowledgeable, but they don't know much about transportation. That's okay. If they're technology, uh, if, they're, if, they have, if they have good technological experience and if they're good with, with a computer and they know how to do Microsoft Word and they know how to do Excel and they know how to do Microsoft Office, they can help you no matter what their experience level is in, in your company. So make sure you go back to this slide. And by the way, you see that on the, the third bullet point on the right column, any photos of inside or outside of your physical plant, you need to take those and put them in your proposal, but make sure you take good photos. Uh, I was, we were doing a proposal last year for a company in Oklahoma and they sent us photos of their office and oh my God, I'm thinking we can't put these in a proposal. 
there was pictures on the wall turned sideways. There was wires. They hadn't emptied a waste basket. <laughs> the photos made them look bad and not look good. So make sure your staff is dressed nicely the day you take the photos. Make sure your office is cleaned up. If you're taking photos of uh, your parking lot or outside, make sure the cars are parked. Make sure it doesn't look chaotic. You know, make your photos uh, in a way that your company looks good. Okay, we can go to the next uh, next slide as well. Now, as I explained early about the scope of services and the proposal requirements, most of, the, of these RFPs actually provide you with the information on how to organize your proposal. Remember what I said earlier, if you learn how to extract the scope of services and the, and the contract requirements and just copy and paste them onto a, onto a, uh, uh, a page of Microsoft Word, you've already started your proposal. Now, some proposals are not an outline. I'm sorry, some proposals are required to be done online. In other words, they don't want you to print it. They just want you to go on their website, throw everything out. Okay, that's fine. But if, if it's not an online application, and you actually have to print out a document to hand in, make sure you create a cover page. Like we saw on the very first slide uh, where you had that real nice photo there and the name of the company, everything else. And then create a table of content for the selection committee to follow. Remember, you are dealing with bureaucrats. You're not dealing with uh, uh, people that are in no transportation. Even if you're dealing with a private company, like, uh, like a hospital or a corporation, you may not be dealing with people that know anything about transportation. After they purchase transportation, you know they're going to purchase something from a plumbing contractor, and after that, they're going to purchase something from an engineering firm, and then they're going to, you know, they're, then they're going to be purchasing something from, uh, you know, a painting contractor. They're just in the purchasing department. They don't necessarily, they're not necessarily transportation experts, so don't expect them to be. So make this like uh, uh, something so very very easy for them to understand. Okay, we can go to the next slide now. And now you have to have a nice cover letter and only let it be one page and kind of explain, introduce yourself, have the company information, a little bit of the experience, just kind of a summary, and then the authorized signature. But again, so now you have basically, you're into this thing already and you have at least three pages so far. You have the cover page, it looks like on the cover of a magazine with a photo and a logo or something about your city, whatever. Then you have, uh, the table of contents, and now you have the cover page. So you're not even starting the proposal yet. You got three pages. Okay, let's go to the next. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> Again, I go back to the heart of what you're proposing: the scope of work and the contract requirements outline the RFP. Follow any directions in the RFP that give you the exact order and the information to be provided. You can use the scope of work and the contract requirements as your outline. In other words, you can use their outline in the RFP as your outline in the proposal. And then you wanna jazz it up a little bit. You wanna insert graphics, insert some customer feedback. Now you may be sitting here saying, Joe, I don't have anybody in my company to do this stuff. I just was talking to one of my clients last week. He's in Ohio. He has a small company. There's only six people in his company. He wanted to do a real nice proposal. He's just not that sophisticated. But you know what? He's got a son who goes to college who is very skilled in Microsoft Word, Microsoft Office, Excel, PDF. So he brings his son into the office to help him do the RFP. So who's working with him? So he's got his, he's got his mechanic working with the son to create a, uh, a, a something about the way they maintain their car. He's got his, his, his accounting people working with the son on how to create a page on how they do their billing. He's got uh, the son working with the dispatchers on the dispatch system and so on and so on and so forth. So this young fellow knows a little bit about transportation because his father owns a company, but he doesn't know much. He's only like 19, 20 years old, but he does know how to create documents. And so that was his talent. And I don't know if he worked for free, if the father paid him or not, but you know what? The proposal ended up looking pretty good because he's the, the young man knows how to put in like, graphics and he knows how to pop, copy and paste photos and he took a, he took a, a, a photo off uh, his, his don't call the city so he took a photo off the city for like uh, off the city's page for the uh, for the uh, cityscape and that was in the front it was just a beautiful attractive uh, proposal and all he was doing was using his talent 
and somebody is, is it wasn't his company, this was in his house. So that was an easy one. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Include any supplemental information that will distinguish you from the competition. Safety plans are very important. There is uh, something that, that the Federal Transit Administration mandates now. It's called a, uh, I'm going to box this. I think it's SSSP or something like that. It's called the System Service Safety Plan. And it's really just a compilation of your driver safety program, your, um, your, your sexual harassment program, your um, drug and alcohol testing, plus uh, things like, um, you know, any plan you have in case you have a natural uh, disaster and the power's out, you know, you have a blizzard, wipes your power out, you have a, you know, you have a, a generator, you have a way to get back online, you have this redundancy, surge protectors, all this stuff. It's really all it is, but it's required and you should get one and uh, you can probably get them online or you can make them yourself, but or you can have the consultant do it for you, but it's, it, you need something like that. You should also have some smart technology, some kind of an app. Hopefully at this point in your, in your company's uh, life, you have some technology where your customers can book online. So you should be able to be able to present that. You should have a staffing model with the bios and resumes that I mentioned earlier. And if you have any recognition, any awards, you know, it's very easy to do this. Let's say you get an email sometimes that from one of your customers, they just put a little email. They send you a note and they say, hi, just wanted to tell you, we rode with John yesterday. He was wonderful when he took us from, you know, our house uh, in Framingham uh, to downtown Boston and back. Uh, the ride was, you know, simple email, simple email. You can take that email, ask the person if you can use it as a reference, copy and paste it onto your company stationery put a little, some pictures around it, something like that, put a photo of the driver and boom, you have an incredible page of a reference just from some 12 word email that somebody sent you. So all you gotta do is get creative and you can turn an email into, you know, something like that. If you belong to any organization, you know, you they probably sent you a, you know, some kind of a certificate saying you're a member of Chamber of Commerce, transit, uh, some transit association, whatever, or this association. Uh, anybody who belongs to the Transportation Alliance, and I have one hanging on my wall. You can't see it in this photo, but I have one hanging on my wall that shows I'm a member of this organization. So that kind of thing. Environmental goals and accomplishments. In other words, if you're running Priuses or running vehicles that are alternative fuels like um, propane, liquid propane, or perhaps uh, uh, some kind of a um, uh, like uh, some kind of a vehicle which switches from from electric to gas or back and forth, anything like that. People are going to lap that up. They're going to like to see something like that. That's what we would put under environmental goals and accomplishments. Okay, we can go to the next slide. You should have current letters of reference. And it's important to remember that everything I'm telling you today is not something that you're going to do uh, when, you, when you answer a proposal. This is what you're going to do tomorrow. You're going to do that starting tomorrow. You can't wait for the proposal to come out, for the RFP to come out. You have to have your ducks in a row. In fact, my, go my goal or my suggestion for a goal is to create a sample proposal coming out of this webinar where you can, you can use them going forward. The clients that I work with, uh, I've, done, uh, I've done as many as 20 different proposals for the same client. Well, you know what? We're giving them the same proposal all over again. We're just inserting the current specifications for the contract we're working with. So it, your, your experience is going to be the same. Your staffing is going to be the same. Your, your vehicles are going to be the same. Your pictures of your place are going to be the same. Your references are going to be the same. The only thing that's going to be different is going to be the contract you're bidding. So it's important to do all this, create a sample uh, proposal, and, and make it very competitive. And also have similar contract information available. Like, uh, let's say, for example, you're bidding a contract in... Uh, I don't know, uh, but let's just say down in Bridgewater. And you also do a similar, but you do a similar contract right now, let's say in Tampa. All right, so so that would be a really good thing in your uh, feather in your cap to be able to say, well, we're already doing this in same service, we're just doing it in a different city. So, and, 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 and don't think it's gotta be some big service. It could be just, just be some kind of a 
shuttle service you do uh, from, um, I don't know, maybe from a car dealership where you take people home when they drop off and have their, they drop their cars off. Or it could be uh, some weekend service you do taking people to the Boston airport or whatever it might be. Uh, being able to show that you're already doing the type of service that's called for in the RFP is something that'll really help you. And, and, and put in the contact information, put in there any revenue or client feedback on the service record. So you're trying to show that not only are you qualified to do the kind of services they're asking for in this RFP, but you're already doing it. Okay, we go to the next slide now. If possible, uh, I shouldn't say if possible, you must do this. You see this first bullet point and the second bullet point, you need to do this. Now, what do I mean by this? Unless you are bidding a brand new service, the service is already in operation. You're just bidding to, to win the contract. What does that mean? That means there's already somebody who's, who's running. Now, most of these contracts with government agencies, they have a certain time limit. They usually last three, four, five years. And then even if they're completely satisfied with the current vendor, they're going to put it out for bid. But maybe they're going out for bid because they're not satisfied with the current vendor. Sometimes these contracts have automatic extensions. Okay, so let me give you an example. So let's say there's a contract in Boston for, I don't know, for let's say, say some hospital or some little neighborhood uh, dial ride service or maybe some elderly service. And some, some uh, it's a five-year contract, but they've only had it, they've had it for five years and they could get a two-year extension, but the transit agency or the city that's involved, they said, we can't stand these people. We're going to put it out for a bit. Okay, not only do you need to know that, you need to know what the current prices are. So look at the first bullet point again obtain the outgoing contractor statistics on how many trips and passengers are being serviced. Second bullet point, obtain the pricing maximum for the procuring organization. In other words, you wanna know about the current contract. You wanna know who's running it. You wanna know how many trips a day they're doing or trips per week, whatever it is. You wanna know what they're charging and you wanna know if they like them. And if they don't like them, you want to know why. These are questions you can ask. You can go to the pre-bid conference and say, and just raise your hand and say, yeah, I have a question. Who's the current contractor? How many trips a day are they taking? What prices are they charging? Why are, why are you putting this out to bid? Are you satisfied with them? If you're not satisfied with them, what is the reason? They may tell you, they may not tell you, but don't you think that's a real good idea to know why they don't like the current contractor? Because if you know why they don't like the current contractor, well, you can overcome that in your proposal. You can propose something alternative, alternatively different. Now, look at the third bullet point. Complete a pricing narrative that informs the procuring organization on how you calculate your price cost. Now, what do I mean by this, a pricing narrative? Here's the difference between a price and a pricing narrative. A price is what you're charging them. A pricing narrative is an explanation of why you're doing it that way. Example, most contracts are bid on a per unit cost, per trip, per person, per mile, per hour. You get it, okay? This is the way they, they bid contracts. But sometimes there's some flexibility there. For example, let's just say you're building a dial-a-ride service for the elderly. Let's say they, they're in a particular, let's say Quincy, you're going to bid a, a, something in Quincy, Mass, and it's a dial ride service for elderly and disabled people. It's going to operate Monday through Friday from 7 to 5 o'clock, on-demand service taking elderly and disabled people. Now, maybe it's only within the confines of Quincy, maybe uh, one leg can be in Quincy, which means it can start in Quincy and it can go outside to Canton, or it can start in Canton and come into Quincy and so on and so forth. You need to understand that. You also, can, you also can make your bid more attractive if you make the price flexible. Instead of saying, for example, I'm going to charge $3 a mile, you can say, I'm going to charge $3.50 a mile for anything up to eight miles, and then anything over eight miles is going to be $2.50. So that means if you have a 16-mile trip, you're going, to get your three, you're going to get your $3 per mile. But if that's your price, I just made that price up. But my point is that you may be more attractive to them because they may have trips that go out of the region. I'll give you an example. I actually have a client, a client in Quincy. And before COVID, he did a lot of this McKinney-Vento work. I'm not sure if you know McKinney-Vento work, but that's the government program in which you take homeless children 
or a displaced family. You pick up a child uh, who lives 10 miles north and you take them to his old school 10 miles south where they used to live. And because of their homeless, they live in a different place, but they want to keep the child at the same school. Well, he, he had like, I don't know, 100 vehicles running around. I have no idea what happened after COVID, but he had a big contract. There. So he used the wind contract by creating a very uh, attractive price because he was being given a lot of long trips and the school system or the state whoever was doing it was giving him stuff because he was rewarding them for giving him long trips the longer the trips the less they paid per mile but he didn't care some of his trips were 34 40 miles long and that's a round trip so he reduced his price the longer the trip went that's an example another thing might be you may want to say i'm going to charge per hour but I'm only going to charge for eight hours a day. If it runs longer than eight hours a day, we'll eat it. So in other words, if your driver goes on the road and, and he's on the road for the first half hour and, and then it takes him a half hour to get back in at night, you're going to eat that. Okay, that would be something you're saying, okay, we're not going to charge you for the half hour the driver drives to his first pickup from our office or the last half hour he drives home. You can be uh, creative and that's what we call a pricing area. And then the last bullet point, complete the pricing forms if required. Okay, we can go to the next there's always a number of local, state, and federal required forms that must be completed and signed and sometimes notarized. If you've ever gotten a mortgage for your house, you know what I'm talking about. You sit there and you sign and you sign and you sign and you sign and you're thinking, oh my God, when can I stop signing? Okay, the answer is never. <laughs> I'm kidding. But sometimes there's you know, 20, 30 pages here. And you know what? Sometimes you miss them because some of the pages look different. Uh, I've had clients who've gotten their proposals rejected simply because they, they didn't sign a page. It's terrible, but you know what? You're dealing with a heartless bureaucrat sometimes. So make sure you sign it. So here's where it comes in. Look at the second bullet point where I have a green check mark. Delegate this to a detailed staff member to make sure all forms are completed before signing. Any forms that are required but not included will validate your proposal. So don't do this yourself. You're busy or your, your manager is busy or any other team members that may be working on the proposal. If you have a very, very trusted staff member, regardless of this person's knowledge of your operation, if, if they dot their I's and cross their T's and they're very precise, this is the person you want to go through the proposal. Or you know, bring it home and give it to your spouse. Bring it home and give it to your, uh, you know, your, your, your cousin, somebody. Have a, another set of eyes go through it to make sure everything's been signed. And then the last bullet point there, make sure all the agenda are attached, completed, and signed. Remember what I said earlier, that after the proposal comes out, a lot of times they put out addendums. If you do not get them, you're screwed. You have to get them and make sure you sign them. Most of the time, those addenda will not change the proposal. They just want you to make sure you got it and you signed it. Original signatures should be signed in blue ink. I have had clients learn that uh, the hard way. Uh, a lot of these government agencies do not want you signing in black ink. They want to know that you've actually signed it. If it's black, sometimes they think it's, uh, you know, it's an automated thing. Uh, maybe you didn't really sign it. Maybe it's uh, phony. It's part of the printing. They want, I don't know the reason, but they want you to sign in blue ink. Okay, we can go to the next slide. When you submit your proposal, make sure you've completed every requirement. Again, the contract requirements and scope of services, you've got to make sure all of those are filled out that you understand. All federal, state, and local, and uh, federal, state, and local requirement documents attached. I just covered that. All dates and signatures completed, including notarized forms, follow up submission uh, procedures outlining the RFP, and submit it by the deadline. This is an absolutely true story I'm about to tell you right now. This happened in the 90s. My company used to run paratransit contracts. I'm from Miami, Florida. And, uh, and we were bidding a big contract. And it was, you know, a couple million dollars a year. It was pretty big. Even back in the 90s, it was big. I think it was like 12 million a year. And we had a major competitor in town. And they were trying to win the contract from us. And what we did, this is, you're going to believe this. We actually did this. We submitted our proposal and we sat there in the government office where the proposals had to be submitted. 
They had to be submitted one day by four, uh, got Friday at 4 p.m. Our competitor showed up at seven minutes after four. Seven minutes after four, we said, we said to the, the, the contract agent, we said, you should not allow this. He's late. And oh my God, they made a big stink and they ended up suing us and everything else. But we just, you know, we just said, you know, this is right. This it says right here. It, it was not be submitted after the deadline. The deadline was seven minutes ago. And we ended up winning the contract. We already had the contract, but it was just, it was an easy way to eliminate our competition that time. But I'm only tell, I'm not saying to do that. It's a little bit nefarious, but we we did it. I'm just trying to tell you that sometimes you can be eliminated by not submitting it on time. And if you're uh, if you're submitting it online, make a hard copy before you do it. Sometimes you submit it, you think it's done, and then the next day they said, "Oh, we never got it." So print a hard copy uh, and make sure, and always make sure you get an answer back, including uh, an email back. Okay, you can go to the next. Uh, slide and I just covered some of this but if you're submitting the email always convert the document into a PDF in other words don't give them a Microsoft Word document why because it can be changed doesn't mean they changed it on purpose sometimes just when they save it or they're looking at it they hit a wrong key and they move something around or they they hit the uh, enter key or the return key and they wipe out something you wrote maybe they highlighted something to look at they forget they highlight it the next time they hit the return key that's going to be that's going to be uh, deleted. So convert it to a PDF. We use Adobe Acrobat, very simple, uh, easy. It's a free program. And uh, make sure you put it into a PDF before submitting it. If you're delivering a physical copy, make sure you make a copy for your files, deliver it on time, and ask for a receipt. Okay, I think we only have one more slide, I'm pretty sure. Okay, thank you. And if we have any questions, be sure to ask. Can you go one more slide? Uh, 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 no, there's one more slide past this. Actually, Amanda. Okay, again, uh, this is my contact information here if you ever want to contact me or send me a question on this, but uh, man, we're going to have time for questions now. But again, the reason I want the slide to go up is I want to show you that the Transportation Alliance, we're an equal opportunity uh, organization here. So you might say, well, what does the Transportation Alliance mean? Well, it means it's exactly that. It's an alliance of all these different companies. It's an, We have companies in our organization that runs bus. Okay, for example, uh, uh, Tom O'Reilly, I mentioned a little bit earlier, Massachusetts operator. He's got a company that called, that I think it's called Tom's, uh, no, not Tom's, uh, they, I can't remember the name of the company offhand, uh, but it's uh, started by his dad. I think he's only got two taxes, but he runs a bus company, he runs a limousine company, all these different companies. Uh, everything I said today will work for you no matter what car, company, type of company you have. Uh, no matter, and, and this stuff, will, this will work next year or whatever. So. Anyway, I want to thank you for watching. If you have any questions, uh, please submit them uh, to Amanda. Or if Amanda has any questions already submitted, I'll be glad to answer them right now. Yeah, thanks so much, Joe. That was great. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to either put them in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself um, at any time, please feel free. Um, I have uh, some initial questions that have come through. Um, so you kind of touched on this, but if I'm a small company and I have no resources to do this kind of um, uh, proposal, um, what do you suggest we do and where should I start if I can't hire a consultant? That's a really good question. And, and there are a lot of uh, companies, I, uh, I work with companies that started and it's just, you know, it's a, it's a husband, wife deal or a brother, sister deal or just a couple of people and they started small, maybe they got three, four, five employees, uh, a couple in the office and a couple of drivers. Uh, a lot of this stuff is really, really not difficult. And the other thing you remember is if you hire a consultant, you're really only gonna pay for this once. For example, I'm just gonna give you an example. I have a client in upstate New York. And uh, the first time, oh, I see your cat there. I have a cat in my office as well. <laughs> the first time, uh, the <laughs> First time I did a proposal for him, it took us, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 hours. So he spent a few thousand dollars to create his proposal. But you know, the second proposal we did for him, uh, we used the same stuff. We just had an update, you know, he had different cars and we knew it a new, it, it, was, it was a fraction. Uh, we did a proposal for him 
uh, a couple months ago. It was a million dollar proposal. His, his our cost him was like three hundred bucks. Why? Because we're using the same proposal over again. It's just he he bid the Niagara Falls Airport, then he bid the Buffalo Airport, and then he bid the Buffalo Bills uh, uh, shuttle. All these different things. He's bidding the same contract. I'm sorry, he's bidding different contracts with the same proposal all over again. So. Even if you hire a consultant, it's probably only going to be, uh, I don't want to say expensive, it's only going to cost you a little bit the first time. The other thing is, if you hire, there are people that will do this online. I mean, there are people that do these online gigs, which they specify uh, that they can write proposals for you. They're really not expensive because if you hire somebody who's, let's say, a transportation consultant, if they cost you, you know, I don't know, uh, hundreds of dollars an hour. But if you hire somebody who's just, a, a technology consultant, they might only charge you 35, 40, 50 dollars an hour. So that means they can work for you for 20 hours for a thousand bucks, less than a thousand bucks. And if you have your stuff, if you like you you hand them your materials, they can convert it from hard copy into electronic. I mean, nowadays you can almost take a picture of it, you know, scan it, and then you know becomes a PDF. You turn it into a you turn it from a picture into a PDF, or from a PDF you turn it into a Word document, so on and so forth. The next thing you know, it's it's pretty easy to do. So, uh, and you can you can you, a lot of stuff is not difficult. So you don't even have to hire a transportation consultant. You just have to hire a person who's really good at writing and creating stuff. And I even gave an example. But the other thing is is uh, and we talked about this uh, before the presentation is you have a team. Just assign different people. A, a, a different job. So in other words, if you want a list of, you want, you've never compiled a list of all your vehicles. Okay, you think you have it, but I guarantee you've sent it to your insurance company. So just look at what you sent to your insurance company last time, because your insurance company insured the vehicle. Look at that list, add some detail to it. Uh, and make sure you have the update the mileage. Uh, you say, well, we don't compile a list of drivers. Sure you do. Look at your payroll. All right, so you may not, when you look at the things on this presentation on each slide, you may say, well, we don't have that, but if you think about it, you have it. You just don't have it in a form that you need to present it, but you have the information. You just ne learn to realize, well, you know what? This is not brain surgery. This is just converting this stuff. And, and again, let's go back to, well, we don't have, you know, all of our computer system, uh, you know, we don't have documents on that. Sure you do. Go on this, as I, I mentioned this the proposal in the presentation, go on the website of the company that sold you the software and download a brochure, convert it into like a, a PDF or whatever, and just pump it right into your proposal. This is not difficult. So what I'm saying is you really don't need to spend a lot of money. You just need to take a little time. And again, you need to start tomorrow. You need to do this over time, knock it off a little bit at the time. Don't Take yourself if you're a small company and you don't you can't afford to spend even an hour you know what do it on a, a sunday afternoon spend an hour or do it on a saturday morning spend an hour or you know assign it to somebody uh to do it just a little bit of the time make a make a, a checklist of the things you need to compile and use this presentation this presentation is going to be in the form of a powerpoint but you can take these powerpoint you can print out each slide individually and then you can just use each slide as a checklist and you can create a checklist uh, of, of, of things, and then you can just put it in, put it in a folder and, and make the slides of this presentation your personal checklist on getting the job done. That's great. Thanks, Joe. Um, another question, um, well, this is actually looking for, do you have any anecdotes you can share about how maybe when a small company has succeeded and been successful in this process? This is, uh, there's so many of these, it's, it's really, really just amazing. But I have a, I have a, a client in uh, the small town in Ohio and uh, he took advantage of his circumstance. He's a minority, uh, he's a veteran mm -hmm. um, and uh, he, he hadn't been using that as, as an asset. So I told him, I said, you have to register as a minority company, as a veteran company. He said, well, Joe, it takes a long time. But anyway, the point is he finally went through it. His wife helped him with it, took him a long time. But once he got registered, he could market himself totally differently. 
he just won a contract that had been awarded to a company 10 times as large as him. He went from being a company that was doing $400,000 a year business to doing, I think, $3 million a year business overnight because he won the contract. I did the same thing with a client in Pensacola a couple of years ago. There's two brothers, two young black guys, nice guys. They graduated from Florida A&M, SAMU, school in Tallahassee, and they ran this little company out of their house. But I said, guys, you're, these guys were both smart. They both had like degrees in accounting. They didn't know a lot about transportation. They were learning that a fledgling, they literally were operating a transportation company out of their house. Their father had loaned them money to, to buy the vehicles. I mean, you're talking about mom and pop. It was a, you know, it was a son and pop business. But they did, I told them the same thing. You have to use the fact that they were a local company and they were bidding against a company from uh, another state. I said, you have to create the story that not only are you local, okay, but you, you are a minority, you are educated, you are doing local business, and you are here to stay. If the company in the other state doesn't win this contract, they don't care because they're bidding contracts right now in Savannah, in Charleston, in Charlotte. You follow me? They're, they're just, they're, they're like, I don't want to say carpet backers, but they don't have any, tal uh, any connection to Tallahassee or Pensacola, whatever the city was. They're just trying to win money. Well, you guys are here all the time. Your entire reputation depends upon you. How you doing? Well, you know what? They won the contract. They went from being a company doing about, I think they were doing $180,000 a year in business. That, comp that contract was $3 million for five years. $15 million contract. They're transformed overnight. Overnight. And they didn't even need to take a lot of money because the Pensacola transit system was supplying the vehicle. You talk about an easy deal. So they didn't even have to, they didn't even need money to buy a vehicle. You talk, but this was David slaying Goliath because the other companies bidding against them were big out of town companies, companies that were doing hundreds of million dollars a year. So yes, this stuff happens all the time because you take your own situation and you turn it into a compelling story. The thing you have for you, don't you, is that you're local. You're there. Your, your, your whole reputation depends upon your ability to perform in your town. You know, if, if, if Transdev or Keolis or National Express or, or uh, MV Transit, if they don't get the contract in Boston, they don't care. They're getting one in Cleveland. They're getting one in Cincinnati. Okay? They're, they, you know, they got contracts in 40 cities. They don't care. But you need Boston. You need your area of Boston, whatever section you work in. Okay, so so it, you use what you think is a weakness to create a strength. You're local, you're there, you're here for the long term and, and, and make that a compelling part of your story. Great, thanks Joe. Um, you kind of touched on this as well, but um, can you provide some more specific examples of some mistakes that you've seen in the drafting or submission process that can and should be avoided that, you know, might not be instinctual? The biggest thing is really not understanding uh, uh, the RFP and not understanding the scope of services and the contract requirements. Now, I talked about some extraneous things like turning it in late, failing to sign it, not using blue ink. I was telling you that because I didn't want something silly to eliminate you. But in reality, the biggest thing you get eliminated for is by not fulfilling the contract. For example, if you don't show that you have the proper insurance and say, well, okay, if we win the contract, we'll get it. Okay, but they not, that might not be good enough. You know, you may need to be able to get a bond or get some letter. A lot of times what I do, if you don't have the funding or if you don't have the insurance, get a letter from your insurance company that says we have a good relationship with like just ask your insurance company for a letter to say we have a relationship with joe rubino uh and his company uh you know uh executive transport if executive transport wins the contract we will be able to provide the levels of insurance required by the contract signed insurance company president blah 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 you put that in your proposal the same thing if you look like you don't have enough money to buy a vehicle say Get a letter from your banker and just say, uh, uh, I, I certify 
that Joe Rubino and uh, Executive Ride Services has a uh, has the proper credit uh, uh, limit with our with our bank to be able to provide funding for 15 new vehicles at a cost of forty thousand dollars a piece. We will be glad to provide funding for that. And bingo, that's in the letter. So you don't need to be wealthy. You don't need to have the insurance. Uh, if you have it, that's fine, but you just need to be able to prove you can get it. So bolster it with stuff like that. The other thing is, you know, letters from people who you're already providing the services from. Now, we're, early in this presentation, I made a reference to the fact that try to bid services, uh, if, you know, maybe a little bit out of town from you, a little bit farther away, but reachable, where you're already providing the same service. What It would be great if you got a letter from that uh, provider. In other words, let's say, for example, let's go back to the example, you want to get a contract in Canton and you're running one in Braintree. Get a letter from your from your customer in Braintree that says, we're very satisfied with Joe Rubino and Executive Ride Services. Uh, we vouch for them. They've been doing this for five years. Now you put that in there. So now you show the guy in Canton, aha, let me tell you something about bureaucrats. And I said this in the other presentation. If you get a copy of the other presentation, the webinar I did a couple months ago, you're going to hear this. Bureaucrats have a sign. It's right across their forehead. It's right here. You know what it says? It says, save my butt. That's what bureaucrats say. Because a bureaucrat, whether he's working for a public company or a private company, they are not telling, they're not hiring the company that they think is the best company. They're hiring the company that they think their boss will think is the best company. You follow me? Bureaucrats' whole goal in life is to preserve their job. They want to stay on and get government workers. They want to work next year and next year. They don't care who's the mayor. They don't care who's the city commission. They just want to keep working. They're, they're, not, they're unelected people. So what are they doing? They're going, to, they're going to make decisions based on what they think the city commission wants or the city manager wants or who the, the, the head of purchasing wants. So they may think this company is good, but, oh, I think my boss will think this company is better. So remember you're dealing with bureaucrats. So... You want it. That's why I'm telling you all this information. You want to make yourself look as good as possible and you want to give as much credence to this. That's what I'm saying. You need to just take all the resources you really have and be able to put them in a proposal. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Um, I think uh, it. I, we'd like to end on if there's any other, you know, high level points you want to just reiterate to everybody and remind folks of, you know, the first step they should take tomorrow or to, you know, if they were to start doing it this afternoon, what's the first step people can take? Well, well I would say, uh, and I've covered these points, but I'm going to say them again. I'll make it more, more precise. Get a copy of this webinar. Watch it again. And even if you have to watch it again, you know, uh, with your staff, you know, you know, you know, come in early in the morning or stay late in the afternoon and, and have you and your staff sit down and watch it and take notes, print out each page of the webinar, not the cover page where I got into the guts of it, and then put them all on a folder, staple them together. This is now your to-do list. And then start working on this tomorrow. Follow everything I said here. Watch it again. The, my whole purpose today was to give you the concept. You can always watch this thing again, all right? But watch this thing again, but print out the pages and go to the other uh, 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 PowerPoint I did a couple months ago. Ask Amanda for a copy of that as well. And print that one out as well. These are go-to. These are like table of contents to how to get through this process. So that's what I would suggest. It's really not brain surgery. It's just following the steps I've laid out. Thanks, Joe. Anyone can access our today's webinar as well as previous webinars on ridelocalma.com. Um, you'll see it under the four fleet operators tab. Uh, you'll see a whole section on our, our webinars and this webinar will be updated in the next few days. Um, Thank you, Joe, so much for this presentation. It was extremely insightful and hopefully folks have got some uh, very concrete steps to take um, in creating some winning proposals. Um, we hope you will join us next week for our uh, next discussion in our series, which is going to be on passenger safety and protecting your passengers and protecting your drivers. Um, I'll put the, um, you can register for that discussion. I just put the link in the chat. 
or uh, you'll be seeing an email come through on that. Um, one last thing Joe mentioned um, that I want to just point out during his presentation is that um, we do, as we find transportation related RFPs, include those in the media watch email that goes out to Massachusetts operators. That email goes out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning. So keep an eye out on for those emails. Um, and you'll see uh, very clearly it says RFP alert if we have any new RFPs that we have come across. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us anytime at info at the transportation alliance.org um, or reply to any of our emails that you receive. So with that, thank you so much, Joe, for today's presentation. And uh, we hope to see everybody next week. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye.